My name is uh, Rafiq Wayani. I'll be talking to you about Windows Server 2016 and many of the features associated with Windows Server 2016. And I'll also give you a, uh, a demo um, so you can see a little bit about what Windows Server 2016 is all about. I've been around in technology for the past 31 years, and uh, so I've been I've been at this for for quite a long time. Uh, Windows Server 2016 is uh, probably one of the uh, operating systems that Microsoft has put out that I am very excited about. I can tell you that. Uh, there are many things that have happened over the past 10 years in IT that have kind of changed the landscape of the way technologists or IT professionals like myself view things. One of the ways that things have happened or things have changed drastically over the past 10 years is uh, virtualization. Virtualization was around 10 years ago. For those of you that have worked with it, know what I'm talking about. VMware was certainly around 10 years ago, 10 years ago being 2006. Except it really wasn't in as much of full force as it is today. In 2006, when I was uh, working with VMware, I remember VMware sending out the message that uh, virtualization is going to happen. The change will happen. And... It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. I remember them saying that exactly. And I remember thinking to myself, well, it is really awesome, but I don't really know how it's going to happen on a large scale. Lo and behold, here we are 10 years later, and you have to almost find systems that are not virtualized. So virtualization is one aspect that has changed the landscape over the past 10 years. The other things that have manipulated or changed the landscape, and I'm going to put this like on the right here, the other thing that has done that is cloud or the introduction or um, the integration with the cloud. For those of you that work with the cloud will recall that you know, just a short 10 years ago, and yes, 10 years ago is not very long, that just a short 10 years ago, um, cloud was nothing more than a buzzword. Isn't that true? Windows Azure, you know, wasn't around. Amazon Web Services, I'm sure they were thinking of it. I certainly never heard of it. Um, I don't know what Azure was, and if Microsoft was working on it, I don't remember any papers on it, and I may have been oblivious to it, obviously. Maybe they were working on it, I wouldn't know. And I know that something like Windows Azure, something like Amazon Web Services, doesn't just come on the scene, you know, overnight. It takes a tremendous amount of effort, time, and planning to be able to get that executed. So cloud has definitely been a big part of our IT life and IT discussions. As a matter of fact, many organizations have adopted the hybrid model where they have some things on premise and some things in the cloud. So cloud is the second piece. So we got cloud, we got virtualization, and then we got mobile. And I'm just going to put in DM short for device management. You know, 10 years ago, <laughs> If you, uh, if you would have told me that uh, I would be as reliant on my phone as I am today for banking, for purchases, for travel, for, you know, what, everything, really, I probably would have, would have told you you're, you're crazy. Um, but, you know, it's true. Uh, even little things like texting, texting, not, I'm not talking about texting for social reasons. I'm talking about my machines talking to me, telling me that something has been completed, a patch has been done, there was an error here, um, whatever the case may be. And SMS messages and text messages are also a way for two-factor, three-factor authentication. They play a part in that. PayPal, Google, Microsoft, they all employ them to verify who you are. They essentially... Um, one of the ways to do it is to 
text you a message or text you a password or some kind and you're re you're required to be able to reply with that password that you were texted banks do it all the time so we have virtualization we have cloud we have mobile or mobile device management what else has happened that has changed drastically changed the landscape well uh, storage technology <coughs> storage technology has done that um, 10 years ago actually probably even six seven years ago uh, if you asked me what was the best way to improve the speed of a particular server a performance of a particular server I probably would have told you other than looking at you know performance metrics to just double the RAM or you know add more RAM to the box and you know and if possible add processors disks is not what it would have come to mind uh, I don't know if that's true with you guys for those of you that have worked with this I never thought about disks 10 years ago as a way to improve drastically improve performance now disks to me were 10 years ago were a, a way to store things and place things and of course was a big issue a big point of contention a big source of contention your uh, disk bandwidth if you will you needed disks in order to be able to uh, you know store stuff and save stuff and run stuff obviously but if you were asking me about performance benefits disks wouldn't come to mind and in the past five years four years solid state disks have changed my mind like a lot I'm sure you agree that you know I probably would tell you look if you can spend money spend it on solid state disks and not RAM <laughs> if you're strictly thinking about improving performance because they the disk the solid state disks improve performance of a machine drastically so we have storage, we have mobile, we have cloud, we have virtualization. Can you think of anything else that has changed the landscape? Well, you know, um, this may be a little bit off-center, but I would say the, um, the number of servers in the data center, the sheer number of servers in the data center, whether they are database servers or web servers, Active Directory type authentication servers, application servers, it really uh, file servers, file and print servers, really doesn't matter. Whatever it is, the sheer number of servers has, I think, it feels as if, they're exponentially higher. Do you agree with me? As a IT administrator, I don't think ever in history, in the past three decades for me, I remember a single person or a single entity like an IT department having the responsibility to manage as much equipment yes it's virtual but as much equipment as they do today and more and more servers are coming to life faster and faster so you know what is the answer to all this and what I mean by answer is I have to be able to manage my equipment. I've got virtualization in the mix. I've got mobile device management in the mix. I've got storage in the mix. I've got cloud in the mix. And I'm just one entity like an IT department or a developer, DBA, you name it. How can I ever forget security? That's something that's on everyone's mind. I would probably tell you that in the um, up until the uh, well, even ten years ago, I don't. Know, I can keep stay, stay consistent. Ten years ago, security was something that was on everyone's mind. But in order to be able to achieve security, you had to give up a lot of convenience. VPN comes to mind, obviously. If you wanted to VPN into your server remotely and you wanted to make that a secure connection, you had to jump through some hoops, you the IT professional, to make it possible for your staff to be able to get into your network security. 
securely and to know that your network is protected. With mobile device management and mobile access in general, people wanted to gain access to their machines using their phones. I know I do. I want to be able to get into my box and be able to see what's happening from my phone while I'm sitting at lunch somewhere, you know, across town or across the country. So um, we have many challenges. For lack of a better word, we have many challenges. We are no longer dealing with uh, gigs of storage. We're dealing with uh, terabytes and petabytes of storage. We're dealing with terabytes of RAM. Right? And we want to be able to utilize these machines in such a way that they are conducive to productivity. I don't want I, the IT professional, don't want to spend my time chasing my tail, the proverbial tail. I want to make sure that I'm moving in an upwardly mobile direction. And that is getting harder and harder to do. There are many vendors that, of course, are responding to those needs. The industry, I shouldn't say vendors, I should just say industry. The industry is responding to every one of these needs. Virtualization, cloud integration, mobile device management, storage, security, the number of equipment and virtualized, virtualized servers you have, you name it. The industry is responding to these requests. So the next thing I would say is um, how do you how does how does Microsoft fit into this picture? You may ask that question. Now, if you really look at it, I love this looking back. <laughs> Windows Server 2008 is looking back. I feel so old. <laughs> 2008 in my mind is so new. So if you really look back at Server 2008, virtualization platform on the Microsoft realm was introduced in 2008 with Hyper-V. Prior to that, we had a virtual server, Microsoft Virtual Server, if you recall that, that was introduced in 2005. And um, in um, Windows Server 2012, in Windows Server 2008, at around that time, the entire System Center Suite was introduced. That was in 2007, when System Center Suite was introduced, the, uh, you had um, System Center Config Manager, Operations Manager, uh, virtual Machine Manager, Data Protection Manager, Orchestrator. And, of course, people that were utilizing SMS, right? people that were utilizing MOM, Microsoft Operations Manager, and SMS, Systems Management Server, immediately or very quickly moved over to System Center Ops Manager and System Center Config Manager. Ops Manager for the people that were working with MOM and Config Manager for the people that were working with SMS. Windows introduced, Microsoft introduced Windows Images. They introduced the Microsoft Deployment Toolkit, MDT. They introduced Windows Deployment Server, WDS. They introduced the Windows Imaging Tool, ImageX, and then DISM, DIS, under Deployment Imaging Servicing Manager, I think is what it's called that made it possible for you to create images and deploy images very quickly. And the Windows Deployment Server, along with Microsoft De uh, Deployment Toolkit, MDT, allowed you to deploy desktop images really without the need of what we used to use, namely Ghost or Alteris. And the tools that were so integrated inside of Windows 7 and Windows Server 2008 and 2008 R2 later on that you really didn't need a third-party tool to accomplish imaging of machines. So um, desktop management really started uh, on the Microsoft realm completely. Microsoft no longer told you that you need to go out and get a third-party tool to image your machines. You could do it right there utilizing the tools that were provided right within the Windows Server platform and Windows Server infrastructure. That is a really big deal from the perspective of time and resources and training and 
budgeting and development and you name it. If I didn't know any better, I probably would say that the reason Ghost is no longer around is because of Microsoft. <laughs> um, who knows how true that is. So we had 2008, 2008 R2. And by the way, in 2008 R2, uh, along with Windows 7, a lot of other features were introduced like branch cache and um, the optimization of wide area network traffic and many new features associated with Active Directory including trash bins and trash cans associated with AD and performance tools that were right built into the Active Directory infrastructure. Windows Server 2012 improved, of course, quite a bit. Uh, when, by the time Windows Server 2012 was released, Azure was around in some way, shape, or form. Uh, Azure and Amazon Web Services have been around for a few years now. Uh, and, they, of course, they've been head-to-head -head for quite some time. Organizations that work with the Windows Server platform work with um, Azure. <coughs> so we have um, Windows Server 2012 R2, System Center 2012 R2, and Microsoft Azure that comes into the picture, and then Azure becomes part of the conversation. So when you really think about it, we are changing the technology landscape Right? And we are working with the technology landscape. So uh, think about this for a minute. This whole evolution of data center. We have gone from these buildings, right? <laughs> right? You have to, um, as time progresses, some of these questions, it says, how much remains unvirtualized? How much remains unvirtualized today? And why is the business using shadow IT, namely cloud services, like Azure? Why is the information officer looking at agile alternatives? Why is the investment in apps growing so much faster than IT? We go back to responding to the user community. Um, things have gone really far, really fast. You know, we're only talking about, um, you know, 8, 10 years. In the big scheme of things, 8, 10 years is not a long time. And especially in the past 4 or 5 years, the number of things that have happened in the cloud and mobile device management and security is, in virtualization, is tremendous. Storage is tremendous. The ability to be able to handle the load is amazing. Is truly mind-boggling. There are some true geniuses at work on the back end. So you really need to rethink your data center, right? You want to think about services, not servers. We really need to think about um, how we can grow and expand and have that elasticity that we need. Traditional data center elasticity is really very, very difficult to come by. Adding servers, adding nodes, Adding distribution and distributed resources, adding disks and network switches and cables and space, it's not easy. So you have the ability now, you have an option to have shadow IT. You have an option to go to Azure Data Center. Many organizations are utilizing it, of course. So as you look ahead, so we have the 2008, 2012, 2012 R2, we end up with Server 2016, System Center 2016, and Microsoft Azure. And uh, this is this Server 2016 is a cloud-first innovation. You have infrastructure and application platform kind of built in and very tightly integrated. You have that very, very viable option. Right. Now, what I have that I want to show you is uh, Windows Server 2016 Technical Preview 4, as you can see right over here. And on this Technical Preview 4, other than some garbage messages I have over here, um, I don't care about that. And I don't care about this either. Okay, on this uh, Technical Preview 4, I have installed Hyper-V. 
And the reason I've installed Hyper-V is because I want to show you Nano Server. Really kind of cool. Really, really cool. Um, I um, I wanted to outline exactly um, what way Microsoft is responding to the needs of uh, well of of organizations, right? And of and of um, our industry because they're the ones making it possible. <clears throat> they're the ones making it possible for us to be able to work with uh, with the high demand and the very fast growth of our uh, technology and our infrastructure and our needs. So you might ask, what is Nano Server? <laughs> and I'm glad you asked that question. And uh, you may not have seen the results um, the way I have. Right? And what I want to do is um, I want to show it to you. I want to show you where Nano Server is and what it really means to you. Give me one second to bring this up. this a little bit bigger okay kind of a not a great drawing here but there is the full server in red you can see that there's a full server in red there is the server core in blue and then there's a nano server. Okay, so this is critical patches, reboots, setup, uh, ports open, and then VHD size. Right. So full server uses up a lot of resources if you look at all the reds. It takes a lot of power. Server core takes up less, fewer resources. And nano server is is nothing, right? It's just it's little itty bitty. Now it is a headless server, if you will. There's really no GUI attached to this. You manage it all remotely. Now the one thing that you will learn about Windows Server 2016 and the way things have progressed and are progressing is that you will not be able to avoid PowerShell. If you've been avoiding PowerShell thus far um, you are not going to be able to do that uh, with Windows Server uh, 2016 it's going to be essentially impossible because with PowerShell you have to write configure and run everything in there you really can't um, you can't avoid it the way you did in previous systems Here's what's going to happen. Um, I am going to uh, create a, uh, a nano server, and I'm going to do it relatively fast. Now, what happens with nano server is that a VHD gets created, okay? a virtual hard disk gets created by PowerShell, and that virtual hard disk is what you use to mount to a uh, Hyper-V, and then you power the virtual machine on. Uh, Nano server takes about 350 meg of disk space. How cool is that? <laughs> and uh, you're able to work with and run through uh, and use it really for anything, whether it's a web server, an Active Directory server, a development platform, really anything. So I have on my F drive here, <coughs> uh, 
I have mounted uh, Windows Server 2016 uh, Technical Preview 4 Media. On my C drive is, of course, my Windows Server. And what I'm going to do right over here through PowerShell is I'm going to create a folder called VM, right, which gets created right there. Right, and I'm going to go to that folder. And once I go to the VM folder, I'm going to store. Okay. So I'm going to store the admin password. I'm going to store, convert to, secure string. And I'm going to say password. Oh, come on as plain text, of course. And then I'm going to do import module. And that's going to come from my F drive, the one where I have mapped or mounted my Windows Server 2016 um, media. I'm going to import this module. I'm going to import nano server image generator right there okay and once I do that I am going to create a new nano server image and I'm going to say that the media path is my F drive which is where I've mounted Windows Server 2016 media I'm going to say that my base path is the current directory base. I'm going to say that my target path is going to be in the current directory a file called my nano VHD and I'm going to say that the computer name computer computer name is going to be my nano and I'm going to say that the I'm going to I want to install the guest drivers let me move it over so you can see. Guest driver. Okay. And in addition to that, guest drivers. And I'm going to install storage. I'm going to install defender. I'm going to install compute. I'm going to enable remote management. Remote management port. I'm going to set the admin administrator password to admin that I created right up here. Right there. Right. And I am going to, let's see, what else am I going to do? I am going to assign it. No, not IPv6. IP, IPv4 or address of 192.168.18.19. So I got all that. And I'm going to press Enter. Off it goes. Okay. So it's creating that uh, virtual hard disk. Right. There's a base directory that I told it to go to. And it's going to put my nano VHD right here that I will be able to add to Hyper-V and then power on. Now the thing is, is that um, the image that gets created, like I said, is headless. It really doesn't really have an interface. But I will show you what interface is. You see where it says Server Tuva? That is the internal Microsoft name for nano, that's their internal project name for nano server. That's what Tuva is, okay? <clears throat> Excuse me. So it's creating that nano server right now. And once it's done building, I'm going to open up um, Hyper-V and I'm going to attach the VHD that it creates right over here and I'll be able to power on the nano server. And I'll show you 
I installed a lot of things in there. I could just as easily in Nano Server install um, IIS. I could really make it an Active Directory server. I could, you know. Now the other thing, while this is going on, uh, I don't know if you heard this or not, but Microsoft has introduced Core CLR. Core CLR. Core CLR is the common language runtime of the .NET framework that is going to be available in the open source environment. So it's going to be available for uh, it's going to be available for Linux and for Mac OS X. That means that you're going to start to see many Microsoft tools there. And since Core CLR is going to be available on the Linux platform and you know Microsoft and the Mac platform, if you will, you'll be able to grab and manage. Uh, Mac images and Linux images very effectively. SQL Server already announced. Is that true? SQL Server already announced that it's going to be available on the Linux platform soon. Let me find that announcement. SQL Server. <clears throat> Show you so you know in case you hadn't heard, in case you are the final one out of the bunch here. Look at this. So it's on March 7th. So yeah, this is posted on March 7th. EVP of uh, Cloud and Enterprise Group here. Okay, so SQL Server on the Linux platform. It's going to extend SQL Server to also run on Linux. Right? And it says it's going to be available mid-2017. Isn't that cool? So you know now, um, the reason to go to Oracle, the reason to go to other database platforms is even less than it was. One of the big things that Oracle was dealing with is, hey, we're portable. We can go here. We can do this and we can do that. Um, yes, Oracle has a marketplace, obviously. But Microsoft, with the introduction of uh, SQL Server on the Linux platform, is going to give them a run for their money. For those of you that like Linux and work with Linux, I know I do. You're no longer going to be prevented from running SQL Server on the Linux platform. Right? You no longer have to deal with just Oracle or just MySQL. You cannot work with SQL Server. And uh, like I said, Core CLR is going to make a lot of that happen as well while we're waiting for this thing to finish. So, power of Azure with the control of the data center. And, you know, the complete Azure stack. Now, one of the things that um, Windows Server 2016 introduced was uh, Azure AD. You can actually authenticate and integrate Active Directory on the Azure side very easily and effectively on uh, your on-premise Active Directory. Okay. So, a very powerful structure. And Windows Server 2016 is very much cloud inspired. Okay, so you have scale, agility, and availability. Okay. And look at the way it has been. 64 virtual processors, one terabyte of RAM, four terabytes of RAM per host. Okay. This is a uh, you know 64 terabyte VHD a virtual hard disk file. Over a thousand VMs. I mean, we we really you know, networking capabilities, heterogeneous environments, right? And all of that is built in. Right? All of that is built in. So, see here. There you go. Created the log. I just got done. There we are. If I go over here, here's a my nano that I just created. All right, and a 680-some meg. I guess because I put some stuff in it. Okay, but that server 680-some meg. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start Hyper-V Manager, like here. And I'm going to create a new virtual machine. I'm going to call the virtual machine My Nano. Generation 1 virtual machine. Okay, Leave a gig in there. I'm going to connect my one and only network card and click next. Use an existing virtual hard disk and I'm going to browse right to my VM, my nano, to 
So there's the existing virtual hard disk. Finish this. All right. Done. Right click, start it. Right click, connect. All right. So inside of my, remember that password that I used? The capital P at sign. Administrator for the user ID and that password will allow me to get in and you'll see it's a minimal interface. You're able to configure IP addresses and firewalls, but that's really about it over here. Here you go. Look at this. So here if I do administrator, put in the password, it authenticates me. And here I am. Here's Microsoft's Windows Server 2016 Technical Preview 4. Two by, as I said, the, tech, the um, internal name. I'm in a work group. There's a date and time. All right. And there are networking and firewalls. So if I just tab over to networking and I press enter, press enter on my Ethernet card here, it tells me the IP address that has been configured. I'm very good with this. There we go. So there's the IPv4 address. Um, and I would have to, and it got it from DHCP server. Right? And I'm, I'm able to get into IPv4 settings by pressing F11 if you look on the bottom right hand corner. And I'm able to manipulate this and customize this and so on. Okay. After that, I essentially uh, manage this utilizing uh, uh, PowerShell. Right. So I assigned a gig of RAM to this. I didn't need to. And you can go from a generation 1 to a generation 2 VM if, I, if you really want to. But that's how easy it is to create um, you know, a nano server. I wanted to show you a very quick way that a nano server is built. Okay, so nice and easy. Um, you know, once you get your hands on it, okay, to give you a little bit of uh, information about my about the machine that I have, this machine that I'm running uh, Windows Server 2016 Technical Preview 4 on is uh, Dell PowerEdge uh, R710 back from six years ago. It's got 24 gigs of RAM, half a terabyte of disk space, and it's got a, a dual quad-core processor. So it's a relatively old machine, I think, and I'm running uh, this on it. I have older servers, believe it or not. I have uh, Dell PowerEdge 1950, the first release, and on the on those old machines, I cannot get Hyper-V to load in the 2016 arena okay, because I I am missing some um, hardware components. Right? But it works excellent. Now, the components behind this, right, all I did here is I created a nano server really, really fast. Okay? you are able to pick and choose what components you want to build. Look at what it's doing over here. It is, you know, it's, um, I selected the server that I wanted to build, my server 2016, and it attached a VHD. It created a single partition, formatted the Windows partition. It assigned a path to it. There's a system volume location, applying the VHD image essentially, and then applied the image, making it bootable, it fixed the device ID, made sure the device was bootable, closes a VHD, closes the Windows image, you know, and essentially it's done. And here's a log of, you can go look at, sitting here in my user's directory. So I can see what it did to build this. 